There are a ton of new features in the fifth generation Intel Xeon Scalable, up to 64 cores with 320 megabytes of level three cache, built-in accelerators, AI acceleration, and beyond the processors, the servers are way better too. So today we're gonna get into it, so let's get started. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we are gonna talk about the fifth generation Intel Xeon Scalable processors, but with a twist. Now looking at new processors and new servers is always fun, but I wanted to go a step further. So I asked the folks at Supermicro and I said, hey, what if we got a brand new generation, so Emerald Rapids fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable server, and we configured that with some like, you know, processors and some memory and all that kind of stuff. And we looked at like kind of, what does a new server look like? And we normally would do that during a new processor launch. But the thing that we're doing a little differently here is I said, let's go find a Cascade Lake. So second generation Intel Xeon scalable processors. And let's go take a look at like, what is the generational uplift if you had the kind of highest end servers that you could get, or at least the common servers that you could get maybe two years ago. And so I just wanna say thank you to both Supermicro and Intel for helping out making this video what it is today. We're gonna to say that they sponsored the video because we couldn't get access to the pre-release hardware if we didn't have their support. Now, a lot of times when we do these launch day pieces, what a lot of folks find is that, sure, you know, we always look at the top end SKU. And of course we have the Intel Xeon Platinum 8592 pluses or whatever those things are that are 64 cores with 320 megs of level three cache. We'll talk a little bit about those in a bit, but let's face it, most people people don't buy the highest end SKUs. So what I asked Supermicro is I said, hey, look, let's go configure a system that uses like the most common, you know, go look at your sales data and let's go figure out what the most common Cascade Lake or second generation Intel Xeon scalable SKU that you sold. Like, let's go figure out what that was. And then let's go put a one new system together around that. And then I said, let's not take the highest end SKU for the fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable, but let's take something that's maybe a little bit further down in the stack that we expect to be a high volume SKU. And that is why we have the Intel Xeon Platinum 8568Y. Now, a lot of people may ask, well, why did you choose Cascade? Like, I'll tell you exactly why. The second generation Intel Xeon scalable processors were the still like the state of the art until Q1 of 2021, or at least the beginning of Q1 of 2021, just before Ice Lake or third generation Xeon Scalable launched. And the other thing about the second generation Intel Xeon Scalable is that the core counts and just the SKUs were largely the same as the first generation Intel Xeon Scalable. So the second generation Cascade Lake, what you saw was you got things like VNNI, you got some clock speed increases, and you also got the bug fixes for Spectre and Meltdown. And so really there's this period between 2017 and maybe 2021 where this type of architecture was like the architecture that you would go deploy. So whether you're on a three year or a five year upgrade cycle, these are super relevant. And to be clear, if you just are running a web server, you may not think, hey, I need a new processor because whatever you have might be running it just fine. But the other side to it is that so many folks these days are trying to figure out how do they go add AI accelerators rather those are you know accelerators or GPUs to their existing footprint in a data center. And that usually means that you have to take your existing like kind of server footprint, all your virtualization containers, all that kind of stuff. You have to go and shrink that footprint so that way it fits in less power and less space. So that way you can go deploy the big AI servers. And so with that, I do wanna talk about the fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors and what's new with those. Now, really briefly, I do wanna just talk about the fifth generation and what's new versus the fourth generation. So this is Emerald Rapids versus Sapphire Rapids. Now, the new fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors can be dropped into the exact same sockets as the fourth gen, which is Sapphire Rapids. The reason that's important is because if you're buying a new server, say a Supermicro X13 generation, well, now you could just buy the new Emerald Rapids ones, have the new technology. And so I figured, let's just talk about that real quick and what do you get that's actually new? The headline feature is is of course the new 64 core chips. Sapphire Rapids technically had a couple of 60 core SKUs, but there are very few of the 60 core SKUs out there. There are at least three 64 core Emerald Rapids SKUs. So it just seems like the overall core counts seem to be going up in this generation. Next, let's talk about memory. You get DDR5 5600, which means that you get a nice bump from the DDR5 4800 that was in the fourth generation Xeon scalables. And the other big one though is the cache, which has gone up by an absolutely massive amount. The top end, I think of the previous generation was like 
five megabytes of level three cache, but now that's 320 megabytes. That's roughly a three X increase just generationally. The UPI speed has also increased in this generation and UPI is the socket to socket interconnect. So you get more bandwidth between the two sockets, which is always a good thing. One of the other really big ones though, is that you finally get type three. So CXL type three device support. Now what this means is that you can actually get memory, like just plug in cards, right? You can get either the card version with dims or you can get E3.S will be the other common form factor. And you can just plug more memory into the system. And you might ask, well, why does that matter? Well, let's say for example, that you were to take like these Astera Lab CXL type three memory devices, where you just go and plug dims in. Well, that gives you two things. One, it gives you additional capacity, but two, it gives you more memory bandwidth. What this new generation of processors can do is actually interleave the standard DDR5 channels with CXL devices and give you more effective memory bandwidth as well as more capacity. There's other modes where you can have separate pools of DDR5 and then also like CXL memory, but that's a little bit more complex. And now the fact that you can just interleave them makes it just kind of nice. This is really Intel's idea where you have eight memory channels on board, but then you can go and expand using CXL. But since the comparison that I really wanted to do was really versus like the Skylake and Cascade Lake generations of processors, which were the newest ones that you could buy as of Q2 2021. Well, there are a couple things that I think are really important to just kind of look at, right? First core count, you go from a maximum of 28 cores up to now 64 cores. Those 28 core parts from the Skylake and Cascade Lake generations, I think only had about 38 and a half megabytes of level three cache. Compare that to like 112 and a half on the Sapphire Rapids and 320 megabytes on the new Emerald Rapids parts. The memory speed may not seem like a big deal, but you went from DDR4 2933 to DDR5 5600. And you also go from having six channels of DDR4 memory to eight channels of DDR5 memory. That means that you get, well, four more DIMM slots potentially per CPU for more capacity, but it also means that you get another 33% more memory bandwidth just by having more lanes. So the net effect of moving from six channels to eight channels, as well as DDR4 2933 to DDR5 5600 is that you get about two and a half, maybe a little over two and a half times the memory bandwidth, which is absolutely awesome. And oh, by the way, on the memory side, Cascade Lake had some kind of strange memory things that were going on. But if you got like the refresh Cascade Lake processors, they were limited to one terabyte of memory, whereas Emerald Rapids is like four terabytes of memory. So you get a four X increase there. So the other big story, of course, is PCIe. On the first generation and second generation Intel Xeon Scalable, so Skylake and Cascade Lake, you only got PCIe Gen 3 and you got 48 lanes of that. Now on the newer Sapphire Rapids and Emerald Rapids processors, you're getting 80 lanes of PCIe Gen 5. And that means two really important things. The first one, of course, is the fact that you can just connect more devices because you have more PCIe lanes, right? You have effectively two more by 16 like layer controllers that are on the chips, which is pretty awesome. But the other thing is that those lanes, they're not running at the same speeds. Instead, you get PCIe Gen 5, which is a full two generations newer. That means that you can connect up to about six and two thirds times as much bandwidth just from PCIe onto a Emerald Rapids, so a fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable processor versus a second generation processor. That's two and a half years, and you're talking about six and two thirds times performance. But there are other things in these processors as well that I think are really important. For example, you get things like you can have quick assist accelerators that are built in and get, you know, hundreds of gigabits per second worth of crypto and compression just on the chip itself without having another accelerator, without having to go to like a NIC or a specialized like FPGA or other kind of accelerator in the system. You can just get that on the chip now. And there are other accelerators like that. And then let's talk about the big one. And this is one that I think Intel is gonna focus on a lot. And I think you're gonna hear a lot of, which is the AI capabilities. Now, of course, NVIDIA will say, well, hey, uh, great Intel, you guys have, you know, your, your AI acceleration AMX, and that's all well and good. But it turns out that AMX is actually more important than you think. Well, the storyline in the industry is, of course, that you have to go get AI accelerators to go and, you know, offload everything. That doesn't always happen. But an awesome example of this, I just got to go over to Netflix and talk to him about what they presented at AWS reInvent on how they actually use CPU based AI inference and machine learning during their encode process. We often talk about AI inference as kind of like a small part of a bigger workload, like if you have an ERP or something like that. But it's a really great example of where extensions like AMX and those types of things that are in a CPU will actually have an impact without having to go all the way to an accelerator. So you have both onboard acceleration, but then you also have these like new instructions and these new features for key things like AI. 
And something else that I just wanted to do was take a look at these super micro servers with, you know, two different generations. Now we got these two servers that you might think are the exact same generation. If you're just looking at the front of them, the only difference is really the drive bay configuration. And I apologize guys, we just, these are, you know, like pre-production servers, or at least one of them is. And so, uh, you know, we just couldn't get the full drive bay count in the pre-production one. But what I wanted to do really quickly is just tell you that they are actually completely different. The one with the full set of drive bays, that's actually the Cascade Lake generation. So this is the fastest and also one of the best servers that you could get in Q1 of 2021. And if you thought that these things were basically the same, that's completely wrong. Let's kind of just walk through the server from front to back. So looking at the front, you know, we have the two and a half inch storage on the new generation. You can use things like PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 4 drives, depending on, you know, what you have. We actually reviewed a Kyoxia CM7, which is a, you know, can do 14 gigabytes or 14 gigabytes per second of read speeds, sequential read speeds off a single drive. Drive. To give you some idea, that would have taken four drive bays worth of drives in the PCIe Gen 3 era. Now, just moving behind that, looking at the fans, you can see the Supermicro has a kind of toolless design. And that toolless design, you can just use to go pop out the fans. That's super easy to go do. Whereas the previous generations, they use kind of an older methodology to go and put these fans in there. In 1U chassis, getting things like hot swap fans is actually really difficult just because of the, you know, tolerances and clearance that you have. And so that's something that just, in, you know, is better in this generation. The other thing that you see is if you look back to the processors, you're going to see that we went from the soft, like kind of Mylar or whatever that is, like plasticky kind of soft plastic covers for the airflow guides. So now we have a nice hard cover that is like perfectly molded for the system it has things like, you know, this is CPU one, this is CPU two, here are the different dim channels and you can see that on there too. So this is a much improved system. Of course, we already mentioned that those dims went from DDR4 to DDR5 and we went from a total of six channels, 12 dims per CPU or 24 dims total to the new generations. We have eight DDR5 channels. They're of course faster as DDR5. And then we also get 16 DIMMs per CPU and 32 DIMMs total. So the capacity has also gone up. The processors we already mentioned went from 28 cores up to 64 cores in this generation as a massive generational leap. But even some of the other things around the system are upgraded. For example, we have a newer baseboard management controller. So we get newer, faster management that can do more telemetry data. We also get easier to use risers because they're cabled on the back of the system, we have things like a uh, really good example is that we have a new OCP NIC 3.0 compatible NIC in the back instead of a proprietary Supermicro solution. One quick thing here is that Supermicro uses the OCP NIC 3.0 form factor, which is the SFF with pull tab form factor, which is super easy because you can actually go replace the NIC without having to open up the entire chassis. You can actually just undo the little screw and then pull the, the NIC out, which saves so much time if you ever had to replace or upgrade a NIC. But Supermicro just makes it easy to service like a lot of cloud service provider like servers do. And of course, our PCIe slots going from PCIe Gen 3 to Gen 5 offer all kinds of crazy things. Like for example, PCIe Gen 3, the maximum networking you can get out of that is a single 100 gigabit connection of a PCIe, you know, by 16 slot, right? You're gonna get like one 100 gig connection. Now you can get a single port of 400 gigabit ethernet. You can also do things like you can put those like type three devices in. We mentioned the Astero Labs one already, but it's a good example of how CXL, you know, can be used in these new servers and with these new PCIe and also CXL slots and, uh, and expand your memory. So that's kind of a new use case for these things that just didn't exist in the previous gens. And something else, if we just kind of take that top down view of these servers, you'll notice this really quickly. The motherboard in the previous generation one basically went to the back of the chassis. That is no longer the case. Instead, you're gonna see that the motherboard stops well short of the back of the chassis. And the reason for that is that PCIe Gen 5 signaling is so tight in PCB that you need to have a lot more like cabled connections connections. So you're going to have things like a shorter PCB with more cabled connections. And some of those cabled connections also are on the front of the motherboard. So whereas the PCIe Gen 3 one, you would have all the PCIe in the back and maybe some, you know, some PCIe power in the back. Now you're going to have PCIe power. And you're also going to have on the front of the motherboard, you're going to earn front of the DIMMs and CPU sockets. That side, you're also going to have 
PCIe Gen 5 connectors because you need to go get PCIe Gen 5 to the front of a chassis. So the entire motherboard design has changed as well. Now, of course, I just showed a couple very simple examples of how Supermicro servers have gone up in quality and ease of maintenance and just, just how nice they are in the design over just two generations, just like two and a half years worth of improvement, right? But I also wanted to just kind of talk about, well, what's the performance impact of having all these changes, right? Because if you don't really get more performance, well, that doesn't matter. So for that exercise, Supermicro was a good sport. I said, hey, you know what I really want to do is get like the most commonly used SKU that we can find. Let's take like that and then let's kind of go look at a new Emerald Rapids version and see like, you know, how much more performance do we get? Okay, so let's talk about the performance first. So one thing that you'll notice is that the previous generation Intel Xeon Gold 6252s that we're using, these things are 24 core and 48 thread parts. The clocks are kind of just a normal Xeon range, but the cache is actually 35.75 megabytes on these chips. And we have a pair of those CPUs installed in a Supermicro 1U Ultra server that, you know, I think is a really nice server from that generation. I really like it. And we came up with the closest thing that we could of course, with the new Sapphire Rapids one, but we increased the core count on these CPUs just because, well, the overall processor line has way more cores than it used to. And so these new Intel Xeon Platinum processors have relatively similar clock speeds. However, there are some big differences. The first big difference is just the core count. We've gone from 24 cores up to 48 cores. And so that doubling the core count automatically should tell you that something new is going on. The other thing that we see is that we now have 300 megabytes of level three cache, which is a lot more than we had in the previous gen. So at this point, I think a lot of folks are just gonna look at this and say like, hey, you had 24 cores per processor and now you have 48. So like, of course, you're gonna see about two X of performance, but that is not the case at all because there are a couple other things going on here. First, we get a little bit higher clock speeds on the new ones, we get that larger cache. And then we also have a number of architectural improvements. Those architectural improvements mean that we have two generations of newer cores and each generation, you know, you probably get 10, 15 ish percent performance per generation of cores. So from a pure CPU perspective, we have more cores, a little bit higher clock speed, way more cache, and at least two generations of architectural improvements under the hood. And when we look at our performance data, we can really see what's happening. If you just need a core per VM or something like that, then you are only gonna get maybe a two to one consolidation ratio. However, if you're really trying to get more of a performance per socket or VM or something like that, and you don't need to just do a hard assignment of like cores to VMs or whatever, then you can get a lot more performance, like more like a three to one consolidation ratio. A lot of the performance per socket that we're seeing is about three to one, which means that you just frankly need fewer servers. But that's only part of the story. We've already taken a look at some of the really awesome things that the fourth generation and fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors offer. And those things include things like quick assist technology. So if you wanna do things like crypto and compression offload, well, you can use quick assist technology and there are built-in accelerators in the chip that allow you to do hundreds of gigabits per second of crypto and compression, which is just absolutely awesome. We'll link to deep dive in this, but the accelerators are very similar to what we would have seen in the fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable. The other thing though that is really important these days is the fact that you do have AMX and Intel did do some AMX improvements in this generation. And what that means is that not only do you have faster CPU performance, but where you might have had to have a dedicated like GPU for doing like AI inference in the past, you may not actually need to add that GPU in like this generation because you have the built-in acceleration in the course. And the thing that might be completely mind blowing to folks is that this is something that really happened again from the beginning of Q1 2021 to Q4 2023. This is only 10 quarters of advancement and you're getting like three to one consolidation ratios in that mid, the like kind of mid range part of the SKU stack or upper mid range of the SKU stack. That's absolutely crazy. And by the way, I was up in Oregon recently and I asked Lisa Spellman, who is the VP and GM of the Xeon group. She's like the head of Xeon. And I asked her just, you know, about this whole generational improvement. And this is what she had to say. So you're going to improve the performance uh, 
in every vector, not just from the acceleration, from the cores, from the memory, from the platform, um, from the entire ecosystem, uh, your entire operation, your network is going to run better, and you're gonna drive down the cost of your services in a very meaningful way. You're gonna get 100% TCO savings. You're going to be hitting your SLAs with a much smaller footprint, and you're gonna be better positioned to hit your ESG goals and uh, drive a sustainable operation. Last thing is, you are creating space for your developer community to actually drive after and get after new workloads. And I know a lot of folks are gonna say, hey, what about AMD and Bergamo and all that kind of stuff? And hey, next year, there's gonna be Sierra Forest from Intel and Intel's gonna have way more cores than anybody. And so, you know, why, what about like, why this today, right? And I asked Pat Gelsinger this and uh, I forgot to record the answer. I took a couple photos, but I forgot to record the answer. But his short answer was simply this, you know, hey, Intel is selling a ton of Xeon servers today. And those Intel Xeon servers that it's selling, well, this is the option that's an upgrade to the fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable. It uses the exact same platform. So of course you would wanna go use these new fifth generation processors. Now we've talked about the performance consolidation ratio of maybe a two to three to one, but what about on the power side? Now the new chips 100% do use more power. Just to give you some idea, we saw idle power in the new generation of servers that was about 2X what we saw in the Cascade Lake or second generation Intel Xeon scalable. So if you put our two supermicro servers side by side, you plugged them in and had them run at idle, you would see way lower power on the previous gen one. And oh, by the way, we're moving up from 150 watt to 350 watt CPU. So you might automatically think like, oh, well, this is gonna use way more than 2X the power, isn't it? And the answer to that is no, not even close. So the new systems will run in that maybe 950 to maybe one kilowatt range or so, you know, if you're kind of just pegging them. But on the other hand, if you look at the previous generation systems that we were looking at, those things would often use maybe 700, 600 watts. And so what you're really talking about is getting two to three times the performance but for only about 50% more power. And I know a lot of folks are gonna say, no, 150 watt to 350 watt CPUs, you should be using more than 2X. And the reason that you don't is just because you don't need as many systems, right? You don't have all the extra fans, you don't have all the extra dims, all that kind of stuff, just sitting there using power, right? And so by consolidating the number of servers that you use, you not only consolidate the amount of space that you have, but you also greatly consolidate the amount of power. And again, since so many folks are trying to figure out how do you take your existing and compute footprint, shrink it down so that way you can have AI servers. Another way to think about this is that every time you go replace two or three of your servers that are even just two and a half years old, and you go and you replace those with the new servers, you're easily freeing up about a third of an HGPU system's power and space by just going and upgrading to these new servers. Or the other way to look at it is that maybe if you had nine or 12, depending on like how much you're using them, servers, and you consolidated those to three to four of the new servers, well, that means that you get to put a new HGPU system into a data center. So I guess the real question is like on the key lessons learned, like, well, what did we learn with all this? And I think, you know, frankly, we learned a lot of really good stuff. I think that if you are sitting on previous generation Skylake, Cascade Lake processors, something like that, well, it's definitely time to upgrade. By upgrading today, that means that you need fewer servers. So even if you don't need like a massive amount of compute, something that you're probably being asked about is like, how do we go add AI servers and more GPUs and AI accelerators into the mix? And well, one way that you do that, is especially when your power and space constrained is you gotta shrink the footprint of your legacy apps. And if you wanna shrink your footprint and you wanna stay Xeon, well, you just go get the new Emerald Rapids or fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable CPUs and you're ready to go. And the servers of course are way better in this generation than in previous generations. We went through a couple examples just using super micro servers so we can kind of compare, you know, the X11 versus X13 generations and the difference is absolutely massive. Now, of course, we're gonna have more Emerald Rapids and all that kind of stuff on the STH main site. So if you wanna go see that and reviews of these servers, you can totally go do that on the STH main site. Definitely check that out. So if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.